<laughs> TikTok, time to rock. How is everyone doing this evening? We're going to have to uh, apologize because we're going to have to cut this short. Um, uh, internet fluctuates. If any of you have done uh, live streaming and stuff like that, uh, you can have internet problems. And there is a problem between my connection with Tony right now. So we're going to uh, probably chat for a few minutes, um, see if this internet lasts more than a minute or two. Yeah, but basically, those of you, uh, I mean, when I had that internet between Anthony and that, that oneness guy, uh, Anthony, he normally has good internet, but good internet, but for that time, uh, his internet was cutting out like every 30 or 40 seconds or something like that. So we are just going to take some questions here, but we don't want to, this is actually an important topic, um, Muhammad's plagiarism. So the plagiarism in the Quran. So we actually want to make sure that when we do this topic, we have a good, solid internet connection. So we're going to postpone that for a different night. We're going to chat and, and probably call it a night. Tony, why don't you introduce yourself for everyone? We'll see how you're, we'll see how you're sounding right now. Just so you know, for like, the, for, for like the last 15 minutes straight, it was nothing but garbles. And then, uh, and then he cleared up. And then uh, his internet connection was testing at point two, which is uh, uh, upload. So that's really, really, really rough. It's uh, it's not consistent enough for us to do it. Again, happens. That's happened with uh, like half the people I live stream with uh, have had that problem. Uh, but all right, good, good, Tony. While you're while you're still clear, you're not going to be clear for long. Okay. But right now, you're clear. Okay, just want me to introduce myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm Tony Costa from uh, Toronto, Canada. So I'm. Um, a Christian apologist. I teach at uh, Toronto Baptist Seminary. I also teach at Heritage College Seminary in Cambridge, Ontario. I also do some teaching with the University of Toronto and also a pastor in Toronto at the Oakwood Wesleyan Church. And I'm a, a, a big fan of David Wood and uh, known him for many years and, uh, and I love him. Big fan of David Wood. So you're the one. Yes, I'm the one and only. You're not, you're not the only one, by the way. Uh, just did a video about a jihadi who really loves me. Okay, uh, it's hard to get that type of love. Jihadi was telling the the ju the jury at his at his trial on terrorism charges. So, uh, yeah, David Woods got it right. You check out his videos. Go. His videos are so clear. There you go. <laughs> um, all right, so you're actually you're actually perfectly clear here, though, Anthony. So uh, again, I don't want to jump in the topic and then have us you know uh, have to stop right in the middle of the of the right. topic. Um, right. but questions, questions, we can, uh, we can take questions until, until something goes horribly wrong and then we can, uh, basically sign off for everyone. Uh, so yes, if, guys, if you're tuning in right now, we're modifying the topic because we're having some technical problems. We don't have a uh, consistent, uh, internet connection right now. So we're not going to launch into a topic knowing that we might have to end any minute now, but we will take some questions. Um, let me take some comments and questions here. Uh, so. Uh, Robert says, what shows up in the Quran is what you would expect for a fallible memory and Arab supernaturalist inclination. So what show, what we find in the Quran is, now th this is interesting. Uh, this is, I, I don't think Robert intended it this way, but this is sort of, this is more Bayesian reasoning, right? Taking, mm -hmm. you take a hypothesis, uh, at least in, right. in this, in this kind of, a, uh, in this use of, of, you can you can take Bayes' theorem and uh, end up with a bunch of different kinds of equations. And one cool use of it is actually for comparing two hypotheses. But uh, one interesting use of it is figuring out what you would expect from a hypothesis, and then then looking at the evidence and seeing how well the evidence lines up with that hypothesis. So, um, so Tony. Um, if we took two hypotheses, one, the Quran is the work of the great God Allah, the eternal word of the great God Allah, or two, the Quran is the work of an illiterate 7th century caravan trader, which of those two hypotheses do you think is better confirmed by the evidence? I think it's the second one, that uh, Muhammad uh, was an illiterate uh, a nomadic trader, and uh, and also <clears throat> that uh, much of what we find in the Quran 
is pre-Islamic. It's not just the stories that we find in there, but as you know, David, the, uh, the very pillars of Islam, four of them, are clearly pre-Islamic. And at the end of the day, Islam has not introduced anything new into the picture. So uh, when Muslims say that Islam was this grand uh, restoration of monotheistic faith, monotheistic religion of the prophets, Islam really has not introduced anything new that we did not know before. All right, uh, here's, a, here's a, uh, an additional, que uh, additional um, question from Robert. He says, uh, what is your opinion about, he said, well, Kira, I think, uh, Waraka, um, what is your opinion about Waraka giving Muhammad uh, a Nestorian false nature of Christ? So basically, what, what, what do you think about Waraka? We, we know very little um, yeah. about these figures, but what, what do you think about him and the, the views that he would have shared with Muhammad, if, 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 you, if we can say anything? Yeah, I, I doubt very much that uh, Ibn Waraka's uh, influence, he was a Nestorian priest, and Nestorians believed, the Nestorian heresy basically says that there were two persons in Christ, that, that uh, the divine word and the human Jesus were actually two persons that united together, which is very strange. And that's not what we get from the Quran. Muhammad clearly saw Jesus as merely a human being, uh, he was not the God-man. He was not the eternal word made flesh. Uh, and uh, Nestorianism does not hold to the view that Jesus is just merely a man. So I, I doubt very much that Muhammad was, was influenced by that. Uh, I think Muhammad was more influenced by an Aryan view of Christ, that Christ, that Jesus was a creature, that he was created by God. Uh, and so Muhammad's Christology is more in keeping with what we would call Arianism and not so much in Nestorianism. Mm -hmm. And so where do you think he, he, came, up, he came about with that view? Now, uh, we, we know that, um, I believe it was, was it Justinian who sort of expelled uh, heretics from the Roman Empire, and so they had to kind of find other areas to live in, and a lot of them went to, That's right. a lot of them went to live in the Middle East. Was that, was that where you think that Muhammad would have come up with this? Yes, yes. I mean, there were a lot of groups out in, in, in the East and Arabia as well. Nestorianism was one of them, but Nestorianism really settled in China and other parts of the, of the Orient. Um, but I think what we find in, in Muhammad's theology about Jesus or his Christology, David, is you find what, what, what can probably be called an anti-Nicene Christology. It's a Christology that attacks Jesus as the only begotten, and that's why Surah 112, Ali Klaas, says that uh, it says that he is not begotten, nor does he beget. And so that's, that's language that is derived from the Nicene Creed, that Christ is the uh, only begotten Son of God. And so what I think you have is clearly a, an Arian Christology that has, uh, because Arians were still around. I mean, uh, today you can find them in Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses are modern-day Arians. But in Muhammad's day, you did have Aryan churches, groups that had moved out of Byzantium and, and drifted off into the eastern parts of the world. Mm -hmm. um, this one's actually for me here. Jacob says, hi, David, legit questions. Why was Nabil arrested in 2010? And why is Zakir Naik and Ahmed Didat's speech banned in the UK? Um, fortunately, if you're asking a question about why Nabil was arrested, uh, I was there. Uh, and so was I. I remember that. Yeah. the 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 official the official um, the official claim against us from police and their police reports, which turned out to be total nonsense, and they were exposed on that because we were recording, uh, was that uh, we were we were screaming at Muslims and telling them they're all going to burn in hell. Fortunately, we were recording the entire time. Um, they put that sort of thing in their police reports. We were about to cause a, a riot and a stampede, and there was a danger to everyone. So uh, the official charge was breach of peace. Um, so that so in, in the police report, it said that you know we were blocking a, an exit and the storm is approaching and there people could have been trampled to death. So police just had no choice but to arrest us. All of that was nonsense. Fortunately, we had cameras. They kept our cameras for almost a month before a judge ordered them to give our cameras back. And once the, once uh, we had our cameras back, we were free to post what really happened. And what actually happened was. Uh, some some young people started coming up to Nabil asking him questions about Christianity. So these were, you know, look like 15, 16 year old Muslims, maybe uh, eight or 10 of them. And they were asking Nabil questions like, you know, how can you believe uh, in the Bible? Aren't there all these different versions? How can you believe, if you believe Jesus is God, how can you believe that God 
you know, came out of a woman. How can you believe these things? And Nabil was having a blast. He was praising these young people for the questions. He was saying he was enjoying the time. It was a perfectly friendly discussion. But there are people who don't like it when Christians talk to Muslim teenagers. Even if the Muslim teenagers came up to them, and even if it's on a public street, they don't like it. And so basically the situa situation is various people were going and, co and complaining to police that we were doing things, and uh, police came up and arrested us without actually bothering to do an investigation. And that's why they got sued um, for, after, not a, after refusing to apologize. I'd have, been, I'd have been fine with an apology. Um, didn't happen, so we sued, and they settled out of court, and they had to have posted on their website for three years that they were completely wrong for arresting us and that we didn't actually break the law, didn't do anything wrong. So if you want to know what Nabil did, Nabil was answering questions of Muslim youths in an area where people do not like Christians talking to Muslim youths. Um, all right, as for Zakir Naik and Ahmed Didat uh, being banned in the UK, I don't know how Didat would be banned because he's dead. Um, Zakir Naik, uh, don't actually know why. I'm guessing it's, I'm guessing it's claiming that he's radicalizing people. Uh, I, I, Tony, do you know this? I, I think Zakir Naik is banned from the UK. Do you, do you have any idea why that is? Right. I, I think it's for the reasons you just said, David, that, uh, that they do believe him to be radical and that he's had some connections with, uh, well, funding uh, groups that are considered terrorists. So that's uh, oh yeah 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 one. yeah yeah so and and those are those are similar complaints up oh, someone saying I'm too loud compared to you so I will switch our volumes here check 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 why is this check, so loud this thing is normally not this loud <laughs> hang on hang on hang on I'm gonna adjust this in the uh, system preferences here I got to get all technical one th one thing I constantly mess up on is sound so <laughs> so. <laughs> I gotta learn to. I gotta learn to fix this. Let me fix the input volume here. Check, 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 check. Let me fix that. I always have problems with that. And then I. The thing is, I don't realize it until later. <laughs> so I'm listening to it afterwards, and I'm like, ah, I'm twice as loud as this other guy, or I'm I'm only <laughs> half as loud as this other guy. Oh, oh no, <laughs> no wonder. I'm using the wrong mic. Okay, that I'm using it. I'm using the built-in the built-in mic, which is right. Here. All right, here we go. This should fix everything. Check, check, check. All right, that should sound better, ladies and gentlemen. Should sound more consistent. I was wondering why I'm adjusting all these mic settings and nothing is changing, and I'm just getting more and more horrible. All right, all kinds of technical problems today. <laughs> hey, check this out. <laughs> Uh, wait, wait, wait. L matter of fact, uh, Tony, let's do let's do a, an audio test. Since I'm surprised you actually held in this long with a uh, okay. point, with a point two internet connection, but um, <laughs> since you're since you're still on there, let's do a mic test. Uh, check, check, All check. Right. Now I think I'm too low. Let me let me crank okay, myself check. up here. One, check, two, check. Tick tock. Time to check. rock. Check, check, check. Guys, how'd that sound? One, two. Yeah, keep talking as I'm talking. Check, 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 check. Okay. One. Okay. All tell right. Us. I'll keep talking. I while think we're about talking. the same now. We're about the same. Awesome. No, I said I think we are. Oh, You're saying, saying okay. They're, they're saying it. Turn it back up. I can turn it up. I can turn us All up. Right. Check, 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 check. Check. One, two, <laughs> one, two. All right, guys. I think that's about as good as we're gonna get right now. They good. All right. Wait now. Anna's saying too low. What the heck? I can't win. <laughs> I can't win today, Tony. Yeah, please everybody. <laughs> All right, we're, we're just going to stick with that, ladies and gentlemen, because we don't even know how long we're going to be here. So, all right. Now, um, <laughs> medical doc says, so we're listening to a diagnosed psychopath. Yes, <laughs> yes, you are. You are in the chat. <laughs> you, too, are listening to a diagnosed psychopath. 1994, David Wood was diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder. Um. All right, I'm gonna. Oh, hey, never mind. Some people say the sound is good. So, all right. Hey, uh, uh, Stephen, Stephen, your buddy Stephen Atkins, my buddy too, said, uh, yeah. Tony got David banned in Canada. <laughs> I wonder why. How's that? Yeah, people, a lot of people don't know that. They always say, David, come to Canada. I'm, I'm banned from yeah. Canada. I showed up. Yeah, I, I went, know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, here we have uh, Always Awesome 
says, so proud to become ex-Muslim and now proud to become Christian. Awesome. That's Great. Awesome. And everyone be sure to pray for always awesome here. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I'm laughing. I'm laughing at some of these questions here. Um, let's see. Uh, <laughs> Snoop. Snoopy SN100 says, I guess Tony has uh, uh, Frontier Internet. <laughs> the Canadian Frontier type, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Um, did you hear the Unshackled episode about Nabil? It aired on New York City WMCA over the past two Sundays. I love Unshackled, although the voice actors for you and Nabil were hilarious. Uh, Gerard, I have no idea what you're talking about there. Uh, have you heard of Have you heard of a show called Unshackled, Tony? No, I haven't. Looks like if W. I heard, I heard of a I heard of a terrible book called The Shack, but that's yeah, not unshackled. <laughs> um, yeah, so WM yeah WMCA so it's got to be radio. So apparent, I guess they re Gerard is is that a did they reenact us or something like that? There was there was a there was a video where they reenacted a well, well it was Nabil giving his testimony, but then for like flashbacks they had reenacted us yep. and they made me like this uh, this total dork. Um, <laughs> But Nabil's talking about his buddy from college, so they made me like a college student, not telling everyone right, I, was, right. I was, you know, I just spent five years in prison and stuff like that, and I got out. So they, <laughs> they did not uh, represent my my thug my thuggishness properly, right. as far as I can tell. All right, here you go. Eric Braun said, does the Bible mention a physical description of Jesus? No, it doesn't. It just tells us that uh, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. What we know of him is that he was a uh, first century Mediterranean Jew. Um, he was of the tribe of Judah. Um, and uh, we know that uh, he, according to the New Testament, which is the earliest documents we have for Jesus of Nazareth, um, he was born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth, and died in Jerusalem. And he was raised from the dead and uh, that was the start of the christian faith so we don't know about his physical description uh but what we do know was that he was a mediterranean Jew. Mm -hmm. and um what's uh what's interesting is is kind of what this tells us about the religions like you you know uh, that muhammad muhammad's followers were constantly talking about how white he was and how white his face oh, yes. was and how white his belly was and how white his arms were and how white his armpits were and how white his legs right. were and so on. And so you've got one group that's kind of obsessed with it and mm -hmm. you've got the Christians who care so little about it that they don't even mention it. It's not even, it's not even that's an right. issue, right? Because it doesn't matter, right? right? He's the word become flesh. He could be green. Doesn't matter. In fact, I said that to a, uh, that's right. uh it was a, it was a nation of Islam guy once who, uh, oh, yeah. I was locked up. His name was Otis. And, uh, <laughs> of course, you know, we started talking about Jesus and the first thing, of course, what color was he? And yeah. I said, I said, look, man, from the scriptures, we know two things. One, Jesus was a Jew. Two, he was green. And if you can't, <laughs> and if you can't see that, there's not even any point in talking to you about yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah. 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 Uh, well, David, see. if I could just mention, I know you put in the description box, but in the third degree videos that I did with my uh, my good friend, Pastor Sully Prince, uh, we deal with the nation of Islam and the black Hebrew Israelites. And we deal with the whole issue of color and and what, what color was Jesus and the whole argument that he was uh, that he was a Negroid. Uh, and, and so if people are interested, they can look at the uh, the interchange between me and uh, Sully. He was green, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, uh, I actually built a case from that from the scripture, um, just <laughs> for people who are obsessed with uh, with color. <laughs> um, hey, here we go. Uh, Kevin says, Kevin says, uh, David, I just watched your video Quran in context. You said part two is coming soon. You're due. Uh, that's because that's videos. Uh, that video is from like I don't know eight, nine, ten years ago or something like that. And I said uh, uh, Quran in context. Just so you know, Kevin, sometimes I make a video and I'm planning a part two. And then when I'm getting ready for part two, I don't like something about the way I did part one. And then I decide I'm going to do it differently and redo it. And then I never actually get around to doing it. And so part two never comes. 
so anyway, plans still in the mix to redo that video. On our, and uh, Tony, I, I've actually been thinking about when I link to my videos from like eight, nine, ten years ago. I I, I, right. I I put them up, and the sound is so terrible because I wasn't even using a mic back then. It was just my lat. I mean, it was just my uh, my 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 um, my camcorder. My right. not very good camcorder from across the room. And so there's all this horrible noise and so on. And so I've been thinking about actually going through and, and, and redoing lots of these videos just entirely um, to get really, really high quality versions. But yes, the Quran in Context was a series I started and then didn't complete. But uh, the, the idea of that, Tony, was um wanted to take, wanted to uh, go through the verses that Muslims say are being taken out of context Right. And to actually go through the context. So the one I did record, I went through, through the historic, uh, historical and literary context of Surah 929, which we always hear the context defense. Mm -hmm. Oh, if you looked at it in context, blah, blah, blah. And so mm -hmm. I went through the context. It turns out it means exactly what it says. Alex, Alex Duncan says, Tony Costa. Oh, man, I love this guy. So glad to see him on David's channel. Hmm. Um, well, thank you. Yeah, and uh, yeah, Tony. I don't know if you know this, but uh, a lot of us think that not enough people know about you. Mm. What are we going to do yeah. about that? I don't know. Uh, I guess mention me more often. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, the reference to I guess I appreciate you putting re the reference to the uh, uh, third degree videos that I do. Uh, I guess it's because I'm up, I'm up in Canada. I don't know. Maybe it's the uh, it's that long border that unprotected border that uh, separates us perhaps that's what it is but uh yeah i mean uh, i guess word of mouth and 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 mentioning uh, my uh my ministry on social media those were those are avenues i guess that you get my email there um but i am quite busy up here in canada I, I believe me i'm quite busy with things here and there i i occasionally visit the united states i'm coming down in um in October to uh, to engage uh, in a in-house debate with a, a Christian believer on baptism up in Long Island. Um, and uh, and are, as you know, David, are you still coming we'll to the conference? The, yeah. Yes. In September. Sorry, I forgot to mention September. Yeah. I'll be at, uh, is it the Strong Tower Conference? Is that what yeah. it's called? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll be there with you. And I believe, I think Jay Smith will be there as well. Yeah, guys, you got, yeah. you got Jay Smith from the UK speakers corner you got Tony Costa from Canada and you got D Dog Dizzle all at the same conference that'll be in Southern California yeah. in September sometime right around the uh you know the the anniversary of the September 11th attacks they usually do it whatever weekend falls uh closest to that uh but yeah Anthony I mean Tony it is a it, is your 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 name's actually Anthony right well my birth name is Antonio but I but Anthony Tony yeah I'm, I'm known by many okay. names okay okay especially um, by Muslims yeah um so, uh, yeah, it is a problem that you're in Canada because most of us yeah. don't care what happens in Canada. It's like, <laughs> yeah, you guys always take our hockey players, you take our actors. I mean, all all the good stuff just heads down south. So we're we're like we're like John. What I mean, Canada? Can anything good come from there? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's not doing too good up here politically. So. Uh, you know, if the Lord opens the door, I may be heading down south. We'll see. I want to find out. And guys, just uh, again, um, the link to a channel that, that Tony makes way a, a lot of videos with uh, the third degree. The link to that channel is in the description box. So check that out. You can check out a bunch of videos uh, with uh, with Tony. And um, man, that conference in California, I want to find out because George changes up the location sometimes. I want to find out where it is. And uh, what the internet is like there. And maybe, maybe if the place has some really good internet, we could try just live streaming the entire conference. And that way, oh, that'd people, be awesome. That way, people can watch it all over the place. Um, all right, DHC. Oh, guys, by the way, because I know I, I see the numbers going up, so I know new people are coming on. If you're coming on, we are not talking about the topic that's actually written on there. We're having some technical problems, so we're going to postpone that topic until we get those resolved. Right now, we're just taking questions from the chat, and we'll probably do this for you know till about nine o'clock or so, and uh, then we'll come back. We'll come back to that topic uh, at a different time. All right. Is Muhammad? Let me see if I understand this. So, is the prophet the only plagiarist, or does he have future redactors as accomplices? So, the question here is: Was uh, was Muhammad the only one who's um, who's stealing from these sources, or do you think that 
you know, future Muslims uh, made some changes? That's a good question. It, that's a textual critical question. And there are plenty of scholars out there who have written on this subject, and they would agree that the Quran has been redacted. That's why there are uh, different readings. That's why there's many variant readings. Um, if we take the traditional approach that Muhammad could not read or write, that he was illiterate, um, many would say that it was his scribes who, who tabulated what he said. Uh, and as you know, David, originally the Quran was tabulated or recorded on, on, on palm leaves, on bones, on anything they can find. Because uh, every time Muhammad would go into a revelation uh, state, which uh, he goes, he begins shaking, falls to the ground, hears uh, bells ringing. Uh, what do you do? You grab whatever's available. So it was, it was always this. Uh, um, it was out of the blue that these things would happen. And of course, the question now becomes: Well, then, who who composed the Quran? Well, then, there's the tradition about about um, uh, Uthman uh, taking uh, one standard edition of the Quran, destroying all other competing editions. And then you've got the Umayyads and you've got the, uh, the various empires arising in Islam. So many scholars believe that, uh, that the Quran was a patchwork that was redone and, 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 and um, additions were made, deletions were made. Uh, Surah 33, uh, there was, Surah 33 at one time was the size of Surah 2. It's no longer that size. Mm -hmm. And so verses have been omitted, um, uh, portions of uh, the, the, the verses of Rajam, of stoning, the verses about uh, breastfeeding the adults and so forth, that's gone missing from the Quran. Um, and so I would say that Muhammad originally heard these stories orally, um, and these stories that we find in the Quran that, that clearly pre-existed Islam, even though the Quran says it all came from God, it all came down from Allah, um, I think Muhammad... Um, passed on that information orally. And I think a lot of the scribes and the later redactors simply adapted uh, the, the text. So I think if you look at the work of Andy Bannister and you look at uh, the work uh, by uh, Brubaker and others, they clearly demonstrate that that there has been, that the Quranic text was an evolving text mm -hmm. for sure. And one of, the, one of the difficulties is that we have, we have, Pretty much nothing to go on from the first century of Islam, right. history-wise. Uh, the first, right. I mean, our, our, our first real biographical source is Ibn Ishaq, which is more than a century after the time of Muhammad, and so right. it's kind of it's kind of open season for that first century to make any kind of yeah. you know changes uh, that you want. In fact, uh, one time I, I made a video called "I Believe in Muhammad." Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, I, I said, I believe in Muhammad. And this was to parody what Muslims do. And so just trying to make a point to them. And so I basically said, um, I believe in Muhammad, but I believe that he was a devout Christian who preached the death, resurrection and deity of Jesus and believed in the Trinity, um, that he won a following in Arabia, but that later Muslims came and corrupted all of that. And then, uh, you know, they, they came out and said that his message was completely different now. Prove me wrong, Muslims, and of course, right. of course, they can't because there's no there's no sources. And so, uh, guys, just notice how easy that is to do, right? When Muslims say yes, we believe in Jesus, you say, oh, okay, you believe in this Jesus that we read about in the first century? No, 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 no. We believe that all of the evidence was changed. Well, great, you can mm. say that about anyone, right? You can say Julius Caesar right. was an alien, and that the sources are just you know made up about him. Say anything you want if you do that. So, as a rule, Muslims, if your method, if your methodology could be used to prove anything about anyone probably time for a, a new method. Um, yeah, and also with the Ibn, the biography, the Sirah that you mentioned, David, by Ibn Ishaq, um, even that, even that uh, biography is no longer extant. It's yeah. been, it was heavily edited by Ibn Hisham. Mm -hmm. And he openly admits, Ibn Hisham openly admits that he had to remove certain parts from the Sirah because he found them embarrassing about mm -hmm. Muhammad. So, so, so now we have the, the redactor of the biography of Ibn Ishaq, who openly admits that he removed parts from it because he found them to be offensive to the Prophet. Yeah, and uh, and and it's cool because we actually know a little bit, um, a little bit of the kinds of things that he would remove because we find other people are quoting them from Ibn Ishaq, and yet they're not in right. Ibn Hisham's version. So, Correct. the story of the Satanic verses. Uh, is not in Ibn Hisham's recension, and yet we know it was there because Tabari quotes it from Ibn Asak. And so right. there was a deliberate effort to here's what's amazing, Suppress. Tony. There's here's what's amazing. They it's 
there was a deliberate effort to remove information about Muhammad, and yet the information that remains is horrifyingly bad, right? And you sit there thinking, yeah. wait a minute, if they were taking out all the bad stuff and what remains yeah. is yeah. all this stuff, yeah. my goodness, what are we missing yeah. here? Yeah, 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 no. exactly. Um, here's one. Medical doc. I'm guessing medical doc is uh, probably a Muslim. This is the one who brought up, uh, you're listening to a psychopath, eh? I put the A on there because you're Canadian, then maybe you can understand yeah, it. I appreciate that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, medical doc um says there's no image of jesus why do christians draw a painting of jesus what do you think about that yeah i think that uh, originally i mean paintings of jesus emerged as early as the fourth century with the catacombs in rome and the reason why christians did that was because a lot of christians majority of christians were uh, slaves many of them were uneducated illiterate and so what they would do is they would use imagery uh, to help teach biblical lessons. So we see that in the catacombs. Um, later on, for example, you see some of the old churches with stained glass windows, and these were simply ways to teach the illiterate the stories in the Bible because they just couldn't read it. Now, a, a provisio has to be made here, and that is that Christians are not to worship uh, or, or venerate uh, or caress and kiss these images like Muslims kiss and caress the black stone at the Kaaba. That is forbidden. Um, and so um, evangelical Christians in particular, we have no issue with uh, pictures, uh, Bible story books for children and so forth, as long as you make it very clear that these images are simply helpful aids. They are not true representations of what Jesus looked like. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's just interesting, the, the Islamic uh, obsession with images. I mean, I mean, think about this. They'll they'll make a movie about Muhammad, and they won't put Muhammad in the movie, but they'll put everyone who's right. around Muhammad in the movie. So why are you putting everyone, right. if, if images exactly. is the problem, why are you putting images of Abu Bakr and all these other people exactly. uh, in your movies? Exactly. Um, and, it's, yeah, and, the, and the earliest because, painters of Muhammad, David, is mm -hmm. were the Persians, uh, the Shia. Mm -hmm. The Shia Muslims produced uh, many pictures of Muhammad, and later... They would wipe out his face. They would white it out and, and cover it. But there are still, like that famous picture of, of Muhammad um, placing the, the, the black stone, the black stone. Mm. into that, yeah, into that, the wrapping it. Uh, so you will find Persian art by Shia Muslims where they clearly depict Muhammad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the better question, medical doc, would be, uh, why are you guys so obsessed with not having pictures? I mean, your prophet supposedly couldn't read or write. That leaves... That leaves, uh, you know, telling stories audibly or using some pictures. Seems like, seems like it would be helpful to uh, to have some pictures. Um, yeah, David, if I can just add as well, mm -hmm. in, in, in Ibn Ashaq's um, Sirah, there's a story in there where Muhammad went to the Kaaba and cleansed the Kaaba. Oh, yeah. 360 <laughs> idols. It says there that he cleansed the, the Kaaba, yeah. but there was an icon of Mary and Jesus uh -huh. that were in there. And it, he refused to destroy it. Wouldn't do so it. So here we have the prophet of Islam uh, saying it's okay to have an icon of, of Mary and the baby Jesus. And uh, he ordered it not to be destroyed. Yeah, that is perfect. Medical doc, you're a better Muslim than, than your prophet was, right? Did, did yeah. you did you all catch that? So Muhammad is going, he's going to he's going to cleanse the Kaaba. He's going to destroy all the all the idols and so on. But there's a there's there's a, an image of Jesus and Mary there. And he says, uh, I can't do it. It's Jesus and Mary. And he has to he has to leave it. So, uh, right. yeah. So medical doc, your, your prophet was, uh, according to you, really, really bad. Why do you believe in him? Seems like you've just apostatized, buddy, because according oh. to Surah 4, verse 65, if you have the slightest, the slightest doubt about anything Muhammad have said, you're, you're not a real Muslim. You have no real faith. Right. And so you already disagreed with Muhammad on something as, as essential as uh, idolatry, according to you. So that's idolatry. Your prophet's oh. an idolater. He's, he's not. He's obviously not free of all major sin. He's a mushrik. According to you, medical doc, try again next time, pal. Yeah, and Surah 33 says it's not for the believer, uh, men and women, to to disagree with the prophet or to question him. Mm -hmm. So the very fact that, uh, think about this, the fact that if you even question what Muhammad did at the Kaaba there, then watch out, you come under judgment. That's what. That's one of those issues where I always, uh, every time it's brought up, I think I need to make a video about that, and then I always forget to make a video about it. But yeah, we gotta, right. we gotta, we gotta use that one. Um, follow up question from medical doc. Why do you, here's the whole quotation. Why do you call me good? Only God is good. That's what he put. 
Notice, why do you call me good? Only God is good. Now, think through this, medical doc. You're quoting Jesus as saying, why do you call me good? And then saying, only God is good. Guess what? I agree with both those things. Jesus did ask, why are you calling me good? And I agree that only God is good in, in, you know, in sort of an ultimate sense. People can be you know, relatively good and so on. But um, did Jesus? do you believe that Jesus is good? Medical doc, do you believe he's good? Uh, Jesus believed that he's good. He called himself the good shepherd. So Jesus is the good shepherd, the one who lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus is the one who says, who can convict me of sin? Right? So Jesus, according to both Christianity and Islam, is completely sinless. He's the only person who was, according to Christianity. So if anyone is good, it's mm -hmm. Jesus. Notice, he does not tell the man, hey, I'm not good. That wouldn't make any sense coming from Jesus. Again, he calls himself the good shepherd. Jesus asks the question, why are you calling me good? Only God is good. Yeah. <laughs> Muslims, you're supposed to put that together. You don't. You try and you try and twist it into an Islamic meaning, and the only way, notice, the only way you can fit that into Jesus denying that he is God is if you say that he's claiming not to be good. And so you're claiming that Jesus is not good. What kind of Muslims would say that Jesus isn't good? What are your thoughts on this, Tony? I agree with you 100%, David. Uh, the whole point is he's getting the uh, the rich young ruler to uh, understand what he's saying, the ramifications of what he's saying. But then he proceeds to demonstrate that that he is truly God in the flesh because he's able to read his heart and he knows that he's an idolater at heart because he won't give up his possessions, he won't give up his wealth, he won't give up his money. And so there he is telling Jesus, yeah, I've kept all these commandments, you know, don't, don't steal, don't lie, don't defraud your neighbor. Uh, I've kept all these since my youth. And Jesus pinpoints to him that you've broken the very first of the commandments, you shall have no other gods before me. And so he made money his God. And uh, only Christ, only God in the flesh, could be able would be able to read that this man's heart, which he did. Mm -hmm. um, here is a very, very closely related question, uh, sir. Some Muslim apologists quote Jesus when he told the rich young ruler to keep the law, and he will have eternal uh, life to justify their claim that good deeds lead you to heaven, your take. Mm. So guys, the claim here is, um, man, and this is assuming we don't finish the story, but uh, for, for, for the claim here, man comes up to Jesus, says, hey, what, what, what must I do to, a, to inherit eternal life? And Jesus gives him a list of commandments to follow. So Tony, the claim here, again, if we don't finish the passage, is that those are the things you do, and then you'll get eternal life Right. Uh, according to Jesus. So what do you think? Well, the, the whole point uh, of, of the question is to assume that good works lead to eternal life. The only problem here is that uh, none of us can keep the law. This this young ruler can keep it. He broke the very first commandment. Now, it's true that the, that God says in the book of Leviticus, he says, if you keep this law, you shall live. But here's the problem, David. We can't keep the law. The law was was never made to save us. The law was made to show us our sin. It was made to, Charles Spurgeon said, to, to drive us to the foot of the cross where we could trust in Jesus Christ. And so no one can keep God's law. The law is a picture of God's perfect righteousness. Um, now, that doesn't mean we throw God's law out the window. We, we love God's law. We obey uh, the commandments that Jesus Christ has given to us. But the person is, is not realizing is that when you break one of those commandments, the Bible says you break all of the commandments. And therefore, you become a lawbreaker. And therefore, you are under judgment. That's why the coming of Christ was necessary. The atonement was necessary. The only person who kept the law of God perfectly was Jesus Christ. He never broke God's law. He kept it perfectly in our place. And when we come to him in faith and trust in him, God applies Christ's perfect life, his righteousness, his perfect obedience. He gives it to us. That's what the Bible calls justification. God justifies us. And so the whole point of the story, uh, David, if you remember, was Jesus said, if you want to be perfect, if you want to be complete, give up everything that you have and follow me. Uh, and so notice that the law was not sufficient. If it was sufficient, Jesus wouldn't have said, if you want to be perfect, give up everything you own and come after me. And so that's the message is we need the Savior. The law cannot save you. It's never saved a human being. The only one who kept it perfectly was Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, you know, reading it directly off the page here um 
just re- it's it's only one paragraph. I'll go ahead and read it for anyone who's not familiar with what we're talking about. Um, so th- this this uh, I'll read it from from uh, the Gospel of Mark, chapter ten, starting at verse seventeen. Notice what happens here, and it's easy to stop at, at any specific point. But uh, as Tony pointed out, the law reve- the law reveals your rebellion, right? It's, it shows that you are a sinner, your failure to keep it. Now listen, watch, because that's exactly what happens here. It's exactly what happens in the passage. You don't want to start halfway through and then say, oh, it's teaching this without without following it through. So as he was, as, as Jesus here, uh, as he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So here you have it, ladies and gentlemen. And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. That's one we had from uh, our medical doctor. Um, You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. So Jesus gives this list of rules. Obviously, Jesus is answering the question, What must I do to inherit eternal life? And he gives you a list of rules. And obviously, if you follow those rules, you're good to go. You've got eternal life, right? So that's, that's that's the way Muslims want to go with this. Why don't we finish? And he said to him, teacher, I have kept these all these things from my youth up. So he says, I've done all these. I've done them all. Jesus, I did it. Now I've got eternal life, right? According to you, Jesus, according to what you just said, I have eternal life, right? Wrong. What happens? Looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him and said to him, one thing you lack. Wait a minute. What do you mean lack? You're missing, you're missing something here. Something's, something's not right. But he just, he just said he followed all these rules that Jesus pointed out. One thing you lack. Go and sell all you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come follow me. Now notice, you don't, you know, we're allowed to possess things. Right? So why is Jesus telling this guy to go and sell all he possesses? One thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. So notice, hey, you've kept all these laws. You've kept all these laws, but now I'm telling you in particular, because I know something about you, what to do. And then after you've done that, then come follow me. I don't know about you, Tony, Mm -hmm. but I believe that we have to follow Jesus, right? That's right. Exactly. And we need him. And what happened? We already know. But as these were, but at these words, he was saddened, and he went away grieving, for uh, he was one who owned much property. So he'd kept, he'd, he'd kept, he'd kept all these commandments. He'd kept them all, but he couldn't obey Jesus. He couldn't part with his possessions, and because of that, he couldn't actually follow Jesus. And so, guess what? Following all those rules did not get him eternal life. Sorry. Um, Samuel here says, what are you, what's your thought on James White's comment about your video being a mockery to Islam? You'd have to be specific because a lot of my videos would be a mockery uh, of Islam. So, my, but, you know, for any of them, whichever one you're referring to here, um, I would say, yes, my videos are a, a mockery uh, of Islam, but I believe it's okay to mock Islam. So if you want to prove me wrong on that, you can prove me wrong on that. In fact, I believe next month I have a debate on that with a Christian who says that, uh, Christians should not mock. Uh, I'm just going to have some Bible passages to uh, to reconcile that with. Um, we have a follow up on Zucker Nike here. Alicia says Zucker Nike was banned because so this is going back to why was Zucker Nike banned in the UK. Uh, Alicia says Zucker Nike was banned because he has speeches where he promotes real Islam when it comes to jihad, the treatment of apostates and LGBT. So. Um, Again, I, 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 don't, I don't know why, but that, that sounds like it would be right if, if Alicia actually follows, uh, f- is familiar with the case. But yes, apparently Z- Zucker Nike was banned from the UK. We weren't sure why, because I wasn't following the story very much. Um, but yes, him saying certain things about the LGBT community or the treatment of apostates would actually make quite a bit of sense. Um, let's see. Getting some... Uh, some people like you here, uh, Tony. Oh, great! But I can't just post a. I can't just. Post nice a to be of... liked once in a while. It's nice to be liked. <laughs> uh, hey, this is. I don't know if you follow this. I don't follow pretty much anything that happens in Canada, but this is about you, uh, David. Ask your guest what he thinks about convicted terrorist Omar Khadr being treated like a hero by the leftist Canadians. Do you know what this is about? Yeah, yeah, he was the fellow who, um, whose father was part of the uh, the Taliban in Pakistan, 
and um, he is uh, responsible for the death of uh, an American serviceman by the name of Spear, who was killed as a result uh, of him throwing a, a grenade. And um, he was in Guantanamo Bay for uh, a number of years, and then uh, Barack Obama had him released and uh, sent to Canada uh, behind the scenes. And then here in Canada, he was basically being protected by the left as a child soldier. He didn't know what he was doing and so forth. And then to make matters worse, uh, the Canadian Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, awarded him $10.5 million, $10.5 million. And not one of that, not one penny of that check went to the widow of, uh, of Mr. Spear, who, who was killed uh, by Omar Khadr in, in Pakistan, the American serviceman. This is a blight on Canada's history, on Canada's uh, government. Um, he was just recently invited to speak at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia, in, in Canada, and he was given a standing ovation. So here's a man who is a convicted terrorist, uh, connections with uh, uh, with Al Qaeda. Let me correct myself, not the Taliban, but Al Qaeda, and um, served time in Guantanamo Bay, and yet he is lionized by the liberal media here in Canada. And as you know, David, uh, here in Canada, we have a government that is is becoming more and more totalitarian. Mm -hmm. If you want to see a version of Bernie Sanders in Canada, it's the Liberal Party of Canada. And, and under Justin Trudeau. And what Justin Trudeau does is he basically gives all this money to Omar Khadr and our veterans are, are still, um, our veterans are still waiting for um, uh, e e payments that were owed to them. Uh, they've taken the government to court and the, the prime minister once said that the veterans, uh, we can't give them what they asked for because they're asking for too much, but yet he can fork over $10.5 million to a convicted terrorist. So all that to say, David, that we're in big trouble here in Canada. We have a motion that came out a couple of years ago called Motion 103 that pinpoints Islamophobia as, as something that is uh, hateful. It's not a bill and it has not become law, but I believe it will become law in due time. So we're living in a country here where our freedoms are quickly eroding. Um, so freedom of speech in Canada is not what you, we don't have, we have a Charter of Rights and Freedom it guarantees freedom of religion, expression, the media, and so forth. But in practicality, we have a government here that does everything it can it, it can to suppress the freedom of the press and, and, and freedom of speech like the one I'm enunciating right now. So I would be considered a hate monger. I'd be considered an Islamophobe just for saying what I just said uh, here in Canada. Uh, yeah, so guys uh, here in the U.S., whenever you think, wow, it's so bad in the U.S., could be worse. Absolutely. It could be in Canada. And it, Absolutely. It's funny, Tony, because like, because uh, <laughs> I usually don't want to say, you know, hey, your country's garbage and stuff because I don't want to hurt anyone's <laughs> feelings. Whenever I say that to a Canadian, hey, your country sucks, they're like, yep, 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 yep. It yep, sure, it yep, sure does. <laughs> yeah, yep. <laughs> and no it just, here. I mean, it just, what, what, what sucks is, you know, you look at Canada and, you know, I mean, uh, you know, I've never been there except the airport where I got in trouble for being in their airport. But, uh, you know, just yeah. picture wise, you're thinking like beautiful mountains and I guess yeah. moose running around and, uh, you know, ma you know, uh, officers mounted on horses and stuff. And you think, wow, yeah. what a beautiful, awesome place. And it's just yeah. people can screw up any place, no matter how yes. naturally, no matter how naturally awesome it is. That's right. <sighs> Wow. 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 Yeah, wow. We need, oh. we need prayer. We need prayer uh, for the church in Canada. Mm, yeah. No, here's what I think. Here's what I think. Now, you, you find this in, in all these different places like the UK and yeah. France, uh, all these places mm -hmm. where people are, you know, where you've got people who are concerned about the, the direction their, their country's going and so on. Um, and there's there's always, you know, there, there's these two tendencies like uh, one, no, you have to stay and fight for your freedom and defend your country. That's your country and so on. And uh, versus man, get the heck out of there. But <laughs> but guess what? If, if all the if all the actual freedom loving people just got out of Canada temporarily, all these I mean, everything that's going on would just self-destruct the entire population and you'd be able right. to actually move back in later. So come down to the right. U.S., come down to the U.S., <laughs> 
We'll go live every night. We'll have a show. And then okay. once your country self-destructs, then you can move back in and, and come back. Yeah. And rebuild. And yeah. Rebuild from the, from the ground up. <laughs> Um, hey, here's a here's a comment from a Muslim who's not crazy about Zucker Nike. This is cool. Namra said, I'm a Muslim, but I personally don't like the style Zucker Nike answers questions because he uses Candy's examples in religion. Lol, uh, even I don't understand his uh, answers. Yeah, Namra, my my objection would be um, uh, Zucker Nike just, he depends. He, he counts on the ignorance of his followers. Uh, he counts on the ignorance of the, the, the audience. If you want to know my thoughts on, on Zucker and I can detail, check out my video, Islam's 99-1 rule. Islam's 99-1 rule. And the, the basic idea that, that people like Zucker and I thrive on is Zucker and I knows that the vast majority of his listeners are not going to uh, look up what he says. They're going to mindlessly trust what he says. And that if even one out of 100 actually looks up what he says they will be that person will be shouted down by the by the people who mindlessly believe him and so uh this is this is how zucker nike has been able to spread because the things he says if you go through them you you can look up pretty much any bible quote he gives or any argument he gives from the bible you can actually look it up and he's he's totally wrong which means he's either mm -hmm. ignorant he doesn't know what he's talking about or he's deceptive so one of the, one or the other uh tony what are your thoughts on the history's most famous non-debater yeah, I, I usually watch him for comic relief. Um, he is, he, it's amazing that this man has the platform that he does. Uh, he's definitely not a scholar. Is he a medical doctor? Yeah. But when it comes to Islam, uh, it's a lot of it is slate, slate of hand and uh, really smoke and mirrors. And you're absolutely right, David. He, he feeds on the ignorance of the crowds. 99% of those people are not going to check up any of the references that he made. Uh, and so, we, as you know, David, you and I and, and, and Sam and, and oh, James White and others, we've been dying and trying to get a debate with this guy. But um, in India, we, you and I would not be allowed to debate him because we're not Indian citizens. And he definitely won't come to the U.S. or Canada to debate here. But the invitation remains open. So if Zachary Niker is watching this, um, you can come to Canada. I'm ready to debate. Or you can come to the U.S. And uh, David Wood would be uh, ready and waiting to debate. Yeah, and that's uh, that. That's kind of the the most hilarious part, right? That uh, how do you know how many debates you've been just ballpark? Uh, with Muslims, just with Muslims, just just any, just how many debates you've been in? Okay, I would say probably around twenty five, twenty four or so. Mm -hmm. And how many of those were with Shabir Ali? Uh, with Shabir Ali, you're looking at about eleven or twelve. So about half of about half of your debates have been with Shabir Ali, right? Right. Um, and many of us would consider him the the best Muslim debater. Um, far, yeah. far, I'd be far more concerned apart, apart from rhetoric, because Zakir Naik is a sort of rhetorician. Uh, argument yes. wise, argument wise, uh, Zakir Naik is a complete joke compared to someone like yeah. Shabir Ali. Even yeah. though we, we think Shabir's yeah. arguments are bad, they're light years ahead yeah. of Zakir Naik. They're much they're much Definitely. more difficult to uh, to to deal with. Um, yep. So uh, Tony's been in about twenty five debates or so. I've been in I think around sixty, um, probably. High 40s of those have been with Muslims. Um, I, I can't find any Zucker Knight debates except maybe two or three. Not one of them was with an actual Christian debater. Um, he had a debate with William Campbell, who's uh, he was, he was a, he was a writer and a speaker and so on, has, has great material, but he's not, you know, he's not like a, a rhetorician or something like that. And he's not, he wasn't, wasn't a debater. Uh, then he had a debate with some pastor um, out there, I guess, I don't know if it was in India or something like that. But I mean, all the actual Christian apologists and Christian debaters, people who, you know, do tons of debates. So there's people like William Lane Craig and James White, uh, Nabil before he passed, Sam Shamoon, Tony, uh, all these, all these people who actually do tons of debates who won't come anywhere near them. And so, guys, do you really not see why that makes us suspicious when you when you debate two people that the vast majority of people have never heard of and all the actual debaters, you avoid them like the plague? Mm. Notice what, what, what I what I said about uh, Zakhar and I thriving on ignorance. He knows that his followers do not know the difference between this Christian pastor and Sam Shamoon. They don't know who's who. They couldn't tell the difference between them. So he goes in and faces someone he knows, doesn't know a lot about Islam, has never debated before. He'll face him. So this would be like, this would be like me. This would be like me finding some random Muslim imam that has never debated before, has no idea what Christianity teaches, putting him on stage, debating him 
absolutely annihilating him and then running to my followers saying, you see how I destroyed Islam's greatest apologist. Muslims will look at that and say, how deceptive can you possibly be? Guys, this is what your top apologist <laughs> does. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's amazing stuff. Yeah. Uh, here's, a, here's a question. Uh, Christ saves John 3, 16 to 17. Says, I was wondering if you could do a video about psychopathy. Uh, yeah, I'm actually planning on doing that one uh, because of a... Uh, because I got a request about the Joker movie. So people were saying, mm. could you do a, 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 a video about the Joker from the perspective of a psychopath? So yeah, I'll be doing that, but we'll be breaking stuff down. Um, somebody here says, what, how did you get banned from Canada? Um, convicted felons are not allowed in Canada. You can go to Great Britain, you can go to France, you can go to Israel, you can go to all sorts of other countries. Uh, in fact, I haven't tried going to a country I wasn't allowed in, but Canada use different rules. And you know, I'm not making fun of them because that, I mean, you, you it, you could understand why. Hey, if you're going to come to my country, even if you're passing through or something like that, we want to know if you're a convicted felon. So yes, I, was, I wasn't I was going to Canada. I was going to the UK, but I had a layover. In other words, the plane came went from Great Britain to Canada to New York. And when I got off the plane in Canada, they, they were waiting for me. <laughs> they, they got me. <laughs> they, yeah. they got the dizzle. <laughs> um, all right. All right, guys. Well, it's nine o'clock. Uh, Anthony. I mean, I keep calling you Anthony because that's okay. Because the Tony man, <laughs> Antonio. How'd you get the name Antonio? That's more. That's more uh, Italian. Well, uh, Portuguese actually. My my dad uh, was Antonio, so I was junior. So he gave me his name, um, but we we shorten our names here. So Tony's just short form of Antonio. So. Yeah. Uh, uh, for the record. Um, uh, my friend uh, Anthony Rogers is coming here tomorrow so we can record some videos. And my middle name is Anthony. Um, Look at that. But I wasn't, uh, that wasn't, uh, that was, I was named after my dad's uh, drug running partner. <laughs> the guy that he used to, was, he, they used to run uh, marijuana back from, back from okay. between, between Mexico and North Carolina and stuff. And so... Oh, uh, by the way, Gerard Perry. Uh, I keep I keep forgetting. I want I keep wanting to say to Gerard Perry. Uh, Gerard Perry says uh, uh, it's a weekly show sharing testimonies from different people whose lives were transformed by Christ. I saw that you posted a link to the show. So this was the show where they were talking about um, Nabil. So yeah, I saw that you posted a link to that, Gerard. But uh, I won't be able to find it because uh, the comments are going to be gone. I have to basically scroll through the entire program to find it. So uh, when this is over, if you could post the link to that in the uh in the comments section i will check it out and i will check out how horrible how horrible our voices are um that's why people always ask me hey 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 david what do you think about a movie based on you and appeal like nope they'll screw it up one one they're gonna they're gonna make us these you know these young kids and 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 two they're gonna make us really really nice and we weren't <laughs> We were, they're going to make us all, it's, you know how that goes, Tony. It's going to be, uh, yeah. oh, I'm really interested in the truth. And, oh man, I'm here. I'm here. I get the Bible. I'm going to share it with you and, and not, you know, not. Yeah, it'd, it'd be like, uh, yeah, it'd be like Wayne's world part three or something. Yeah. 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 Well, it's like, remember the, uh, the, what was it? The case for Christ, the movie, the case for Christ and mm -hmm. the guy who did William Lane Craig. Uh, and remember you, you even, you even imitated the guy. Yeah. I said, none of these, um, none of these guys sounded like the real, the real McCoy. No, 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 not at all. And Habermas. Come on. Habermas sounds oh, very, yeah, was very exactly. distinctive. Got, got, got to look <laughs> yeah. at the data. That, definitely the data. Got to have 12 facts. Definitely 12 facts. You know what I mean? So come on. That's him. That's Gary. <laughs> all right here. Obviously invisible said Dr. Costa. Did Islam start as a one heretical version of Christianity? So there, 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 are, there are people who say Islam should not be treated as a separate religion. It should be treated as a heretical version of Christianity. So did Islam start as a one heretical version of Christianity, two, a gang warfare ideology, or three, other? So your view on the origins of Islam. I, yeah, I think it's a mixture of all of them. I mean, I wouldn't say that they were christian in the in the strictest sense because they they didn't practice baptism uh which was an initiation into the into the church um but what i would say is that once again the the view of muhammad on jesus is clearly arian so it would have been a heretical view uh and there's a bit of monophysitism david in 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 muhammad's view of jesus 
Monophysitism basically says that uh, that uh, Jesus uh, ha only had one nature. Um, and that is why, for example, when the Quran speaks about uh, Jesus, it refers to him as when it says the unbelievers say that uh, that um, Allah is Christ is Allah, for example. It assumes that what Christians think is that Jesus was God and that he was walking around uh, eating and, and doing things that humans do. And and so Muhammad had this this view of Jesus that he was a mere human being. But at, at the same time, he thought what Christians were saying was that Jesus was just God. And you, and you hear that. A lot of Christ, a lot of Muslims assume that we just think Jesus was God, as if we don't believe in the incarnation that he was the God Man. Um, so I think it's a mixture of of all of those. Um, the theology of Islam, Islam defines itself against Christianity, and so everywhere Islam defines itself theologically, it's always against the idea of God being begotten or God having a son. And so, isn't it interesting that the Islamic creed begins with the negative particle? La, mm -hmm. which means no, la ilaha illa Allah. There is no God but Allah. And while uh, Christianity and Judaism uh, affirm their creeds in, in the positive sense, Hear, O Israel, the Lord of God, the Lord is one. Islam the, begins with a negative uh, confession. There is no God but Allah. And then it says, uh, 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 He does not beget, nor is he begotten. And so without Christianity, I don't think Islam would be able to survive because definitionally it defines itself vis-a-vis -vis Christianity, Orthodox Christianity. So I think that uh, the view of the questioner, I think that all three of them uh, uh, come together. Now, I don't think Islam is just a, a heretical group like the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons. Those groups clearly came out of the Christian church and apostatized. In the case of Muhammad, he was not a Christian. Uh, he was a pagan Arab. His his um, his father Abdullah was a servant of Allah, who was the head god of the pantheon. Allah was the head god of the pantheon. So Muhammad's background was pagan. He never converted to Christianity. If he did, he would have most certainly been baptized. There is no record of Muhammad ever being baptized. So uh, I would see them as a group that arose with a very anti-Christian, heretical view. And uh, it evolved into an Arabian religion. Basically, Muhammad um, took the head god of the Kaaba, Allah, and he divorced all the other gods from him. So basically, what, what we have here is what the famous uh, systematic theologian Augustus Strong called uh, basically paganized monotheism. Mm. Uh, it is a monotheism that has been paganized. And what I mean by paganism is that it retains the pagan roots of Arabia, um, the, the the Hajj, the pilgrimage, Zakat, the, the almsgiving, uh, five time prayers, the Salat, um, and um, and uh, the the prayers, the 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 alms. All of these things are clearly pre-Islamic. And so basically, Islam is a pagan religion that was monotheized, if I can put it that way. Who did you say say that it's a paganized? Augustus. Augustus Strong, he wrote the classic book, Systematic Theology. Mm -hmm. And we're talking 1800s here, so the late 1800s. Uh, so I can send you the quote, David. I can send you the reference. So that was Augustus Strong. Yeah, I'd be uh, yep, I'd be interested in that. Um, yeah. All right. <laughs> Here's one. Sometimes I don't even know why we respond. Um, but Evan here. Because we're gracious. We're called to be gracious, David. This is from earlier when we were talking about Jesus being a Jew. And Evan, genius that he is, said, Jesus was not a Jew, you idiot. <laughs> wow. You, so his name, Yeshua, uh, he was circumcised on the eighth day. He kept Shabbat. He kept uh, the Jewish feasts. Uh, he, um, he prayed the Shema in Mark 12. 28 to 29, Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He quoted the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, his mother was Miriam. His stepfather was Yosef. Uh, his apostles were Jewish. So, uh, quite interesting. Yeah, let, let me. So, let me I'd like to know. I'd like to know what first century source uh, he's quoting from to show that Jesus was not a Jew. The only person I know that claimed Jesus was not a Jew were the Gnostics and Adolf Hitler. Yeah, so apparently we're dealing with one of their own right now. Uh, let me just read two quick passages, though. So this is from John yes. John chapter 4, verse 7. Um, there came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. 
Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman? Now, obviously, um, obviously, Evan is going to say, uh, Hey, Jesus is supposed to say right here, What are you talking about? I'm not a Jew, you idiot. Uh, instead, um, Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Um, John 18, John 18, um, verse 33. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests. Notice, it's your own nation, right? So it's your, what, what nation? The Jews. That's why he's asking if he's the king of the Jews. So this would have been a perfect, a perfect, perfect place for Jesus to say, What? I'm not a Jew? What? I have nothing to do with these guys. And then he'd go free. Exactly. And John 4.22, David, what does Jesus say to the Samaritan woman? He says, Salvation is of the Jews. Mm-hmm. And, 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 his and name, he, he also identifies himself as the Messiah there. So That's right. And, and also his very name, Yeshua, means he shall save. Uh, and, and, and he claims salvation comes from the Jews, which is what God's promise to Abraham was, that from Abraham's uh, loins, from his descendants, a seed, the seed would come who would become the Redeemer of the world. Oh, right. So it's hard to argue against facts. Yeah, that's some... Um... That's some rough stuff to try to try and let me put it this way. If you're going to argue that Jesus wasn't a Jew, you could basically argue anything about anyone, right? So you yeah. could you could say that, uh, yeah, you could say anything, right? You could say you could say Muhammad was Chinese and believe yeah. it, right? You could say a- anything you wanted. Um, <clears throat> let's see. I guess we'll go for about another ten minutes or so, and then close. Sure. Yeah. This was let's do this it. was this was massively. This is this was massively um, longer than I thought we would go. So, <laughs> so some people must have been praying for uh, yeah. Tony's internet connection um, because his internet. If you if you weren't here at the beginning, his internet qu- connection was 0. 0.2 megabits per second, which is uh, as horrible as something can possibly be. Um, and he's still here. He's still here and still coming in clear. So. Good news, good news. Uh, Winners, Winners King said, uh, David, apparently the atheist YouTuber Sargon of Akkad is a fan of your fan of your videos. He has cited your critiques of Islam several times. Yes, and I've uh, yeah um, noticed, guys. We can. What's your view on this, Tony? My view is, hey, just because I disagree with you on one thing, even if it's massively important, doesn't mean I can't agree with you on something else. So uh, yeah, S- no, Sarg- I agree. Yeah, Sargon's an atheist. I'm a Christian. We agree a lot on things, uh, you know, about Islam. If if uh, if it were me and a Muslim and Sargon and the topic were the existence of God, I- I'd agree with the Muslim, right? So so yeah. different if it were. Uh, if the topic were whether Christianity is true, Sargon and the Muslim would agree that no Christianity is not true. So, uh, yeah. yeah, and also under under Islamic laws, you know, David, both Christians and atheists would uh, would be the bad guys. And so, I would rather live in a free world, a free democratic society, where we can talk to friends who are atheists and and pray for their salvation, than live under Sharia law where you are placed in second class citizens. Uh, atheists would probably be killed off because they're apostates and deny Allah's existence. So, in other words, what I'm saying is uh, Jews, and Chris, Jews and Christians and atheists can get along, but under Islam, um, it's, it's, a, it's a completely different ball of wax. And so we both lose under Islamic law. Um, yeah, and, and guys, that, that's, uh, that's the position of a lot of atheists. Um, matter of fact, R- Richard Dawkins, <laughs> Richard Dawkins yeah. said in an interview, he said yeah. uh, that he has mixed feelings about the decline of Christianity in Europe because he's starting to think that it might have been a bulwark yes. against something worse, right? Yes. So here, that's an atheist saying, basically, yeah, we atheists are blasting away at Christianity, but guess what? For 14 centuries, Muslims tried to invade Europe, and for 14 centuries, Christians said, hey, whatever other disagreements we have here, we are not going to be controlled by that. And right. they never they never let it happen. And as soon as things become secular, it's like you can't hand it over fast enough. And so there are atheists who are watching this, going, "Yeah, we we might need yeah. the we might need the Christians on this one because they're actually willing yeah. to to stand up for something." Yeah. So <clears throat> same with Tom Holland. Uh, is it Tom or Tim? Tom Holland, I believe it mm-hmm. is. Tom uh, Holland. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Tom Holland. He's saying the same thing. 
I mean, he's an atheist, but he realizes that Christianity is basically the foundation of Western society. Uh, and and he, he understands that our freedoms, our, our democracies, our, the, the Magna Carta, the Judeo-Christian principles of North America and Western Europe are all based on Christianity. Uh, and, and the thing that, that Dawkins said, David, was he said he fears the alternative that will replace Christianity. Mm -hmm. uh, D Douglas Murray is another one. Douglas yes. Murray. Douglas Murray yes. is an atheist and uh, openly gay, and he's running around. Uh, he he acknowledges that Christianity is sort of the foundation of of Western yeah. values, and he acknowledges the the problems that are coming with Islam, and he really can't figure yeah. out why people are siding yeah. with Muhammad. And, and same with same with David Horowitz. Horowitz, recognize, mm -hmm. being a Jew himself, he recognizes Christianity again here, as again that that bulwark against this 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 uh, uh, oppression that would come under a communist state or an Islamic Sharia law. And also Jordan Peterson, even though Jordan Peterson has uh, a, a view of the divine and so forth, he openly admits that Christianity, Judeo-Christianity, is what made the West great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, again, guys, b bottom line is um, we could disagree on a lot of things and still agree, still agree on something important, right? So um, Christians, atheists, Hindus, uh, even even Muslims who have no designs on, uh, you know, conquering the world and stuff like that can all sort of agree and be on the same page. Hey, there are people who are trying to violently subjugate us and they would gladly kill anyone who gets in their way, even Muslims who aren't on the same page with them because they will regard yeah. you as, as heretical. Yeah. Uh, and we can all sort of unite and say, no, we are, we're not going to be controlled by that. Yep, just like Imam Tawidi, right? Mm -hmm. Whom you've met as well, David. Yep. Mm -hmm. So he's of that same conviction. Um, all right, this is from Shawnee here. Uh, Shawnee said, uh, do you believe that Islam was developed by Satan himself? It seems as if Muslims are under a spell and just cannot see the truth of Christ. Uh, well, yeah, Shawnee, um, yeah, as, as a Christian, we, we believe in, you know, the demonic realm and so on and, we're told that false prophets and false teachers are going to come and that they're going to, you know, they're, they're, they're going to mislead people, that their, their job is going to be to corrupt the gospel. And so lots of stuff you see in Islam just seems silly and stupid. And it seems like Muhammad got it from the surrounding culture, lots of his ideas, lots of his superstitions, lots of his just silly little rules. Um, it looks like just something like, you know, Muhammad took everything that was around him and rolled it up into a ball and called it Islam. So on the one hand, it, you know, on the one hand, you wouldn't have to say that there's anything demonic here. Uh, however, you look at certain things like Muhammad, Muhammad's first impression of his revelations being that he was demon possessed. Uh, story of the satanic verses, stories of Muhammad um, receiving his revelations. And it sounds like something out of the exorcist. Uh, Muhammad uh, claiming to be a victim of, of black magic that gave him delusional thoughts and false beliefs. Sounds like something spiritual going on and when you combine that with uh just the the sort of perfect rejection of the gospel and what i mean by that is muhammad ag agrees with us on a lot right virgin birth jesus miracles jesus the messiah he agrees with us on so much but the the things that he disagrees with us on just happen to be the core teachings of the gospel jesus died on the cross for mm -hmm. sins he rose from the dead and he's lord right those are the core teachings of the gospel according to the apostles in the book of acts so those are the core teachings. And Muhammad comes along and says, guys, I agree with you on everything except these three things, which are the, the core of the Christian gospel. There, it's like too perfect, right? It's, it, and you, you look at it and it just seems, the whole system seems like it's designed to keep people uh, from accepting the gospel and to be obsessed over the silliest things that, that then keep them, that their, their, their obsession with these things then keep them from ever seriously considering the gospel. Uh, what are your thoughts on this, uh, Tony? Yeah, I think uh, the, the New Testament makes it very clear that uh, who is the liar but the one who denies Jesus is the Christ. He denies the Father and the Son. So the two things, uh, in, I mean, there's the gospel which you mentioned, the, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus which Paul says is the gospel, and if you bring any other gospel, you are anathema, which means to be under the divine curse of God. A very, very serious charge. Um, but, but the Bible goes on to say that if you deny that Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of God, uh, which means that he is one with the Father, then you are antichrist. That's what John, 1 John 2, 22, 23 points out. Antichrist means to be against Christ or to be in the place of Christ. And therefore, a denial of Jesus's messiahship and his divine sonship is a mark of Antichrist. Now, Muhammad, 
believed that Jesus was al masi the Messiah, but he denied that he was the divine Son of God. And so, um, so he does not fit. He does not fit the description of what a true Christian or a follower of Jesus Christ would be. Mm -hmm. Um, here's a here's a question in the chat from from Chris uh, Dinho. He said, David, you said that every day you would upload a video about the top countries where Christians are the worst persecuted. I understand this is too much work, but are these videos coming? Uh, yes. Uh, I don't know if you've you've been following where I've been going, but basically, as soon as I announced that, I ended up traveling for uh, gosh, almost two weeks straight, and so. I was thinking maybe I'd be able to keep up with the videos even on the road and did not work out that way. So yes, I'll be getting back to that series because, uh, yeah, just wanted to get, wanted to get a, uh, something I should do every year, keep people updated and keep people knowing how they can uh, pray and so on. Um, legionary 42 says, what do you think of Robert Spencer's book on Muhammad having never really existed? Now to be clear, Spencer doesn't actually claim Muhammad never existed. Uh, it's more like uh, we just we we can't really know if there was a Muhammad. He was if he was probably pretty different from what we read in the Muslim sources. Um, and so the question continues. Fernandez uh, Morera, who wrote the myth of the Andalusian paradise, seems to take issue with a point or two. Uh, I think it was already pointed out by people after this that Robert and I debated this. So we debated whether Muhammad existed. And guys, I'll go ahead and tell you, uh, I believe Muhammad existed. I believe in sort of the basic timeline that we read about in the Muslim sources. I obviously call a lot of what we read in the sources into question. But, you know, the general timeline, Muhammad being born around 570, you know, uh, leaving leaving Mecca, going to Medina, the wars he fought, his death around 632. I, you know, I, I, kind of, I, I agree with the, the general timeline. But if you want to actually defend that you got some problems you got almost no no you have almost nothing to go on for the first century when that's the main thing you're looking for from a historical perspective and it's sort of what's what's missing is so supposedly muhammad's going around he's 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 messaging all these leaders of his time challenging everyone everyone's running around in a panic oh no we know there's a prophet now who's arisen and he's going to conquer us all everyone's in a panic and you look, guess what? We have historical records from the people of the time. No one ever heard of the guy, right? People just did not hear about this guy. And so it seems like there's quite a bit of embellishment going on that people are making some things up. And uh, so in, in that debate, it was, it was just hard, right? It's one, uh, it one of the hardest debates I did, even though you'd think just defending Muhammad's existence is pretty easy. So notice, since I don't have early sources, I had to rely on some secondary historical principles i relied primarily on the on the principle of embarrassment so i argued hey there's so much embarrassing material in the muslim sources that no one would want to invent if they're inventing a religion or fabricating a religion uh, because we know even according to those sources it was very embarrassing to them these stories were embarrassing so they're not going to invent embarrassing like the satanic verses for instance they're not they don't need to invent a story about muhammad delivering revelations from the devil and then to come up with all kinds of ways of getting away with it and, and getting away from it and, and erasing it, right? So my claim was basically there's so many embarrassing stories in the Muslim sources that the only real, the only good explanation is that Muslims recorded these because they knew they were true. And if they're recording some embarrassing material, even though later they're trying to erase it, uh, even if they're recording embarrassing material, then I, I would I would say that Muhammad existed, and that you know we, we might be able to trust these guys on some other things they say if they're if they're trying to be accurate. Uh, Tony, what, what what's your position on the? On yeah, the, uh, I, I would agree with you, David. I think the criterion of embarrassment is a very strong argument. That uh, the stand verse is a, is a prime example of that. No one would just make a story up like that. It's so embarrassing, and uh, I think we see some of that as well in the Quran, where it talks about a blind man coming to Muhammad and Muhammad frowned and looked away. I, I don't think someone would just make that up on the fly. Uh, I think what Robert Spencer's argument is that the available uh, material we have on Muhammad is very scanty and that it comes very late. You, we already mentioned Ibn Ashaq's uh, biography, which was about 150 years after Muhammad and then heavily edited by Ibn Hisham. Uh, but Professor uh, Shoemaker of the University of Oregon made a very good point. He actually said, we have more biographical information on Jesus than we have for Muhammad. Now that's quite outstanding because Muhammad was a seventh century figure 
and Jesus was a first century figure. Yet mm -hmm. we know more about Jesus, biographically speaking, than we know about Muhammad. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that is the issue. And, and Robert Spencer is not the first to suggest this. There are a number of German scholars who've also suggested that Muhammad, the name Muhammad was actually a word, it was a title for Jesus, that the word Muhammad means the praised one. And, and some of these scholars have suggested that the earliest form of Islam called Jesus Muhammad, being the praised one, and they've pointed to the inscriptions at the Dome of the Rock, which I know you, you, you visited, uh, David, when you were in Israel. There are inscriptions on the Dome of the Rock that, uh, that they believe refer to Jesus and only to Jesus. And one of the titles that is given to Jesus is the praised one, Muhammad. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Um, <laughs> just trying to decide whether to go with this. <laughs> All right. Yeah, we'll do it. This is from Diva Girl Love. Uh, she's a Muslim uh, woman. She uh, asks some um, very very silly questions sometimes but we're patient because that's how that's how we are um the yeah. girl love says if jesus was a jew why are you guys are christians like like jesus or unlike jesus um so she's saying jesus was a jew so why are we christians um guess what uh diva girl love all of jesus initial followers were Jews and Christians, right? That's how it started, right? Jews and Christians. Jews uh, had there, there, there's a there's a there's a religion of of the Jews, uh, but Jews is an ethnicity. That's like me saying to some American convert to Islam, "Wait a minute, Muhammad was an Arab, so why are you a Muslim if Muhammad was an Arab?" You don't see the difference between the two. One would be like an, an ethnicity, the other would be an an ideology, following an ideology. And with Jesus, it's you're entering into a a relationship with it. So your your relationship with Jesus as a Christian, that's that's a relationship. It's yes, Jesus, as to his physical nature, was a Jew. What in the name of common sense does that have to do with whether he died on the cross for sins and rose from the dead and him being Lord? Do you do you see this? And and notice, Diva yeah. Girl Love, I just said it. I mean, I just said it. Did everyone hear me say it? I said the impact that Muhammad, because the question was whether this stuff is satanic, whether Muhammad is, is, was actually inspired by Satan, that he gets people, he convinces people to focus on these silly little things and then miss the big picture of the gospel. And Diva Girl Love right here. <laughs> Jesus was a Jew. Why are you a Christian? My goodness. Uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, Tony? yeah well, well, David, the very word Christian uh, means a follower of the Christ. And the word Christ is the Greek equivalent of messiah and so the early jewish believers uh, who followed jesus uh, were referred to as nazarenes they were the nazarenes they followed jesus of nazareth and the word christian was later applied in antioch uh, in syria to the followers of jesus and the very word christian is jewish in, in its context because once again the word christos the word the greek word for christ is the word that Jews used in the Hellenistic world, Jews living outside of Israel, who read the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. That's what they called the Messiah, Ho Christos, the Christ. And so I think Diva Girl's missing something here, and that is... Oh, she's missing, word so, she's missing something. <laughs> something big, yeah. and that is the word Christian is connected to the Messiah. We're, we are, David and I, are followers of the Messiah, the Christ. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And and Diva Girl Love, I've never seen the slightest evidence that you actually pay attention to anything we say. But I'm hoping that starts. In, and, uh, you know, the, the reason I continue is just because for Muslims who do actually pay attention at some point and, and listen, you know, Muslims who become Christians, it, it very frequently takes takes several years. Right. So. We know what your religion has done to you. We know how it's affected your ability to to actually uh, take these things to heart. But at the end of the day, we we just don't know, and so we'll probably continue being patient with you. Um, Warren says, uh, "I'm an atheist and would argue that till God takes my last breath." However, I listen to your discussions religiously, and I just wanted to point that out because. Uh, um, you know, back on the issue of, of Sargon and stuff like that, and uh, us acknowledging that, hey, you know, Christians, atheists, Hindus, Buddhists, we can even, you know, Muslims who don't want to be under Sharia, which, 
for Muslims who actually know what Sharia entails and they know what it involves, the majority of them in the West do not want to be under Sharia. It's it's sad. It's sad because many of them think that they would want to be under Sharia because they're in a complete state of of ignorance about Sharia. They do not know what it is, right? And when you point it out to them, they find it absolutely horrifying, as horrifying as we find it. Um, so uh, yeah. So basically, even Muslims who don't want to live according to the commands of Allah and Muhammad can be on the same page with the rest of us. Um, but what I, yeah, so what I want to point out is I have tons of atheists. I have lots of atheists uh, who watch my videos and uh, I have no problem watching atheist videos. I, I mean, uh, I do shows pretty regularly with the apostate prophet who's an atheist, but we understand. We understand that we're on the, we're on the same side of some very important issues. Um, uh, here's a, I have to, I'll have to scroll down to it over here if I want to put it on the screen, but I could just read it here on the other because, uh, yeah, this is the one where I can pull things up in my program, but I can read them over here. Uh, so this is towards the, the end of the comments. Uh, question. This is from Sammy. He says, how can you prove that God spoke to Abraham and Moses? Maybe it is uh, a myth. God viral in their time would that be possible talking about the Old Testament? So the question is, how can we know that God spoke to Abraham and Moses? Maybe all of this is a myth. Um, and would that would that be possible given, you know, the Old Testament and we, we uh, you know, don't have the, the same kinds of sources that we have? Um, I don't know about you, Tony, but but I would kind of have I would kind of have a stepping stone in there. I would say. Uh, yeah, you're right that, you know, if, if you're if you're in the Jewish tradition, you know, they're all connected, but we're kind of far away from that now. Whereas, you know, if you were living in Israel, you know, they, they'd be passing by a lot of the same places where, hey, here's some rocks that were stacked up by so and so to serve as a as a memorial of things that happen and so on. So they would kind of be, you know, the further you go back, the more they would be connected to uh, figures like, you know, Moses and Abraham, uh, as far as us being you know, historically really, really mm -hmm. far, far away from that. My perspective would be, Hey, I trust Jesus. Jesus is the one who died on the cross for sins and rose from the dead. If I'm going to listen to anyone, tell me about something, probably going to go with the guy who rose from the dead. And since, right. since he took, since he took, um, you know, stories about Abraham and Moses seriously, then I'll take them seriously too. And I conclude that, that God knew what he was doing. Right. And, and it, when you read the New Testament, Jesus makes it clear that uh, God spoke through Moses. Uh, Jesus made it clear that the Torah was inspired when he taught the lessons on marriage and divorce. He goes back to the book of Genesis. He warns about the days of Noah uh, being repeated in our day. Uh, the judgment that came in the days of Noah would also come upon this generation and so forth. But I think uh, if we if we look at the, the, the very the, the whole history of the Old Testament, David, I'm just right now teaching a course in archaeology at the University of Toronto, and we're looking at ancient Mesopotamia, we're looking at uh, ancient Israel, we're looking at Egypt and so forth, the Greeks, the Romans. And what we find is that the story about Abraham is, is it's remarkable. He comes from Ur of the Chaldees, which was an actual city in Mesopotamia, which has been uncovered. And uh, what we find in the story about Abram, uh, before he was called Abraham, was that God had called him out of his homeland to go westward to a land that he would show them. You look at the migration of the patriarchs like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they're all in sync with, with what we find in world history. And also the very customs when Abraham took Hagar uh, to have a child, because Sarah said, uh, take the slave girl, have a child. Well, this was a Mesopotamian law. It's consistent with what we know about Mesopotamian history. And, and also when we look at the whole story, it all connects. When we look at Abraham being told that his descendants would be slaves in a foreign country for 400 years. Uh, we see that realized in Egypt. We also have the promise that from Abraham's line, there would come a Messiah. And then we see it working out between Isaac and Ishmael. It would come through Isaac. And then you've got Jacob and Esau. God chooses Jacob. And then you've got the 12 tribes. God says out of Judah will the, the monarchy come and so forth. And you follow the storyline through the, through the history of Israel, through the prophets, and you come to Jesus, it's a consistent thread. And so if this was not something that 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 God had spoken to Abraham about and and the way he funneled the whole uh, funnel of redemption, that it comes right down to this one man called Jesus of Nazareth, who affirms the whole storyline. Jesus affirms that everything written of me in the law and in the prophets and in the Psalms 
must be fulfilled. And so there is a ring of truth to this. There's an authenticity to this. And what we find in the Bible is a history. It, it is a historical line, but it's consistent. See, David, if, if it wasn't God who spoke to Abraham or Isaac, Jacob, Moses, we would find a lot of inconsistencies, just like you find in Islam, for example, in the Quran. There's a lot of inconsistencies. And, and, that's, and, and, that's all, and, that, and that's all supposed to be one yeah. guy, right? It's one guy. That's it's not, right. Yeah, it's not yeah, people yeah. over. 20, it's not people in, over 15 centuries receiving in, revelation. Exactly in, in the 23 year period. So what what we find in the Bible is the storyline is a consistent thread, and archaeology has vindicated the Bible over and over and over again. It has vindicated the place names, the names of the various kings have been discovered, and so forth. So what we have is a reliable witness. And so the Muslims always treat the Bible as guilty until proven innocent, but they want us to treat the Quran as innocent until proven guilty. I think we need to apply equal balance scales here. Uh, look at the evidence. Where does the evidence point? It shows to a consistent line, a consistent thread. So if Muslims believe Jesus, then they have to believe what he said about the prophets and everything that came before him. Yep, and uh, it's uh, f following along uh, those lines of, of some of these questions. Uh, two two quick mm. things. Uh, one, Cheryl sure. R. Cheryl R. I uh, see so you're having a problem with uh, J.P. Watchman. Uh, just go ahead and ban him. Uh, if, you, if you've 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 already warned him repeatedly, so uh, that's enough. Go ahead and ban him. Um, there, there's guys there. There are different kinds of people who would cause problems in the in the chat. There are people who are just you know complete they're doing nothing but trolling and try to lead people away from the discussion and there are you know people like diva girl love who are asking s silly questions but we kind of don't know i mean it seems like she really believes some of the very silly things she she says and so we'll want to be patient with someone uh someone like diva girl love but uh, other people who are just doing nothing but you know being nasty or saying nasty things and stuff like that uh yeah you you've 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 given you've given repeated warnings so yeah you can ban uh, but High Funk says, uh, I mean, there's something inside Diva pulling her here. Hopefully that can be nurtured through David's patience. LOL. Yeah, that's kind of the, that's kind of the, that's kind of why we keep going. Uh, it's Diva Girl Love could be someone who's just trying to divert the discussion. But you look at the objections and you can see these are things that a, a Muslim who's, you know, been raised all her life to believe in Muhammad's teachings. These are kind of the silly things she could be fixated on. And so, yeah, if she keeps coming back to the live streams, keeps seeing her objections refuted over and over again, keeps seeing her questions answered over and over again, and keeps coming back, we have to we have to be open to the possibility that the uh, you know she's being she's being drawn here for for a reason. Yes. All right, well, uh, Anthony, uh, uh, gosh. <laughs> I call people Tony name. I, I, I call people by their by their full names or by their initials. Um, <laughs> Antonio or Tony. Uh, Tony. Um, we went way longer than I thought your internet connection would last, given how it was not five minutes before we started. Yeah. Five minutes. Five minutes before yeah. we started, I could not understand a word you said. Then it sort of clicked on, and I was able to understand what you were saying. And I thought we were going live just to tell people we we're going to cut it extremely short. And uh, yeah. as soon as soon as as soon as your connection went out, I was going to say, "Ah, oh, well, there we go. Uh, we tried. We'll we'll get back to this next time." In the meantime, we've gone uh, almost an hour and forty minutes now. So um, take any time you want to uh, to sort of close this out here. Uh, any closing sure. thoughts you have for anyone, uh, or any comments you have in response to uh, anyone who's uh, in the chat? Sure. Well. Uh, first of all, I just want to I want to thank my wife for praying for us because she was actually praying in the background. So I'm, I'm thankful to God for her and uh, <laughs> for her prayers. Um, and also, I just want to encourage those who join uh, the live stream and those who join the chat that uh, uh, we're here because we care about you. We love you for the sake of Christ. And uh, we're not afraid of the questions. Uh, God is not afraid of your questions. Uh, Jesus will not be offended if you question him, unlike other prophets who get offended when they're mocked or when they're questioned. So we're here to say that uh, that uh, the power of God's love is 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 greater than all that, and that um, there is hope in Christ. There is a, there's a good news that David and I are proclaiming. We're not doing this for the just the good of our health. We're doing this because we truly care. And the good news is that God loved the world so much that He sent His Son into the world. And that Jesus Christ is the one hope of sinners. He died in the place of sinners on the cross of Calvary. 
He was raised from the dead to vindicate. Uh, God vindicated him in his resurrection, that he is tru truly the Son of God, that he is the Lord. And so our hope and our prayer is that those who are watching and you're Muslims, uh, come on home. Uh, come mm -hmm. to the Savior. He waits with open arms. And uh, those who are not, who are, are Christians, continue to pray for David. Uh, David is one of the very few people I know that is doing. Uh, the work that he's doing is, is, is uh, I, I, cannot, um, I cannot overemphasize how important uh, David's ministry is. Keep praying for him. Pray for his family. And uh, just pray that uh, we will see many Muslims come to faith in Jesus Christ. That's our prayer and our hope. Amen. Um, two quick comments here. Uh, Slam RN said, we were at Mike Winger's show. You have to not both go on at the same time. So Mike Winger was apparently live and uh, uh, some people are upset that we're going live at the same time. Uh, Slam RN, no, we have different audiences. We have all the smart people who watch mine and all the, uh, <laughs> all the other people who watch Mike Winger. Um, you know, we, hey Tony, you know what we call uh, Mike Winger's followers? What do you call we call them wingalings. <laughs> wingalings. <laughs> yeah, we call them wingalings. We're gonna hope that that catches on. <laughs> uh, but what? What, yeah. what? One more quick comment here. You you can actually comment on this, even though we're sign of, uh, sort of closing out. Uh, Jay Shy <laughs> says, Surah six verse one fifteen and Surah eighteen verse twenty seven state that no one can change the words of Allah. Nadir mm -hmm. claims this is talking about the decree of God. What is that? Well, the decree of God is simply like Allah saying what's what's going to happen he is he is he is decreed it he is declared right. it. but you do right. have passages you do have passages in the quran where no one can change what allah has decreed however right Surah 6 verse 115 and Surah 18 27 are both talking about books recite what has been revealed to you of the book of your lord there is none who can change his words so the words there in context are referring to the book, uh, which at the you know at the very least you'd say is the Quran, so it's clearly talking about a book. Uh, but even there are even Muslim commentators have pointed out that if it's no one can change his words, that's going to be all his all his books, right? You can't you can't change Allah's words. And you know if uh, Jay Shai, if 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 it were just these two verses and that's all we had to go on, then you you might be able to to make a case. But when we take into account the rest of what the Muslim sources uh, of the rest of what the Quran says about the Torah and the gospel, it's clear, it's mm. clear and indisputable that the Quran treats the Torah and the gospel as the preserved, authoritative words of God that no one could ever change. And so, yeah, uh, Nadir is basically doing what a, a Muslim apologist has to do. They can't acknowledge that the, that the Bible has not been corrupted. As soon as they do, if they were to acknowledge, hey, the Quran is affirming our Bible, that would be the destruction of the Quran because the Quran contradicts the Bible. And so their religion has forced them into this. Their religion has forced them to look at all these clear claims about no one being able to change Allah's words and the Torah and the gospel being the words of Allah. And Christians at the time of Muhammad, according to the Quran, still reading the true and preserved authoritative word of Allah. And we have copies of the Torah and the gospel before that time. And Allah <laughs> commanding Jews to judge not by the Quran, but by the Torah. And Allah commanding Christians to judge not by the Quran, but by the gospel. And Allah saying that Christians and Jews have no ground to stand upon unless we stand upon the Torah and the gospel, the revelations that have come to us. You put all that together and you walk away and say, yep, that's saying the Bible's been corrupted. Uh, your religion is is forcing you into some absolutely silly positions. And so for you Muslims who are watching, um, guys, if you look at history, Muhammad came out and he affirmed to his followers the inspiration and the preservation and the authority of the Torah and the gospel. Eventually, eventually Muslims went to the Torah and the gospel and realized this doesn't line up with the Quran at all. But by the time they realized that, they weren't free to say it. They'd get their heads chopped off for saying that. And therefore, for 14 centuries, Muslims had to come up with various various ways of getting around this problem. Guys, you are not in that position. If you're, if you're in Europe or America or somewhere, you are not in that position. You are free to say, wait a minute. Muhammad affirms in the Quran that Christians have the authoritative word of God, but the book that Christians have contradicts the Quran. This guy's not a prophet. He's not a prophet. I'm out of this religion. I'm going to something else. And Tony, you've already spoke, but feel free to uh, uh, add yeah. to this and to tell our Muslim friends who are, who are seeing this problem, 
where they should go if they want to realize that the, the Quran can't be the word of God. Yeah, I mean, you've just presented, David, the Islamic dilemma, where mm -hmm. the Quran says it's the word of God, but then they try to use the Quran to say it's not the word of God. So this is the dilemma they're in. And of course, even if it's, you know, the decrees of Allah, it's still the speech of Allah. And the mm -hmm. word of Allah is the speech of Allah. And, and, and Muslims believe that one of God's eternal attributes is his speech. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if Allah gave the Torah to Moses and the Injil to Jesus and the Zabur to David and then the Quran to Muhammad, it's the same speech. It's the speech that comes from the same God, which they believe that speech to be eternal. And here's the problem, David. There was no, to our knowledge, there was no Arabic version of the Quran, of the Bible, rather, in the days of Muhammad. Muhammad based everything he said on hearsay. Uh, but when Muslims did get access to an Arabic copy of the, the Bible, lo and behold, what did they find? Well, Jesus is the Son of God. He died on the cross. He rose from the dead. That's not what the Quran says. And so the only alternative they had to come up with is to come up with this theory that the Jews and the Christians had a mass conspiracy to collect all the manuscripts available and to change them and also to hide the prophecies of Muhammad that were therein. Um, and so the whole thing is ad hoc, David. It's all ad hoc. It's contrived right, right from the start. Muslims, instead of rejecting the Quran based on the older revelation that came before it, are willing to discard the Bible for a later revelation. That's like uh, a, a member of the Baha'i faith coming along saying, Baha'u'llah is the prophet of God, and I'm going to reject the Quran because Baha'u'llah has a new revelation that supersedes the Quran. No Muslim would buy that. But that's the same argument that they're giving to Christians and Jews. Mm -hmm. And uh, let me, I don't know how you guys trick us into going an extra 15 minutes, but uh, <laughs> we're going to do it. We're going to do it just Let's on the hope, on the hope that Diva Girl Love gets this. Yeah. Here we go. Now watch how many problems you have here, Diva Girl Love. So Diva Girl Love responds, Mark, Matthew, and John are not words of God. You left Luke off that list. I'm a, what? Yeah, You're saying Luke is? All right. Now, here are the problems, Diva Girl Lab. Mark, Matthew, and John. Mark, Matthew, and John. I'll assume you meant Luke, too. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You can talk about the gospel as a message, right? The, the, the word gospel means good news, right? So Jesus came with the gospel. That can be a spoken message, a preaching, right? But... From the second century on, the four Gospels were treated as a unit called the fourfold Gospel, right? If you were referring to a text, a book that Christians had, it was either the entire New Testament or from the, from the second century on, the four Gospels treated as a unit called the fourfold Gospel, right? So again, Gospel can be a, a, a preached message. Or it can be a, a book that you have, in which case it's at least the four Gospels, the fourfold Gospel. All right. So from the second century on, the four Gospels treated as a unit called the Gospel. All right. You get to the time of Muhammad. All right. So he talks about Jesus coming with the Gospel. Now, that by itself could refer to the preaching of Jesus. Uh, but we know from Surah 7, verse 157, it talks about people who were reading the Torah and the gospel and supposedly finding Muhammad mentioned in it. So if people were reading it, it's referring to the text. If it's referring to the text, then we know what the gospel was to Christians in the seventh century. We know it. It's not in dispute. It's either the full New Testament or at the very least, it's the fourfold gospel if you're talking about the gospel. So if Muhammad is talking, let's suppose, let's suppose, uh, when Allah reveals that Christians are reading the gospel, he means some other book completely that, that Christians have never heard of. Do you, do you see a problem with that? You're, you're telling us that it's not talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay, but it's talking about the book that Christians are reading. We know what book Christians were reading in the 7th century. We know that. It's, it's indisputable, right? So what you're telling me is that Allah meant something completely different. He's talking about the gospel, but he means something completely different. If that's the case, then your God is the worst communicator in all of history. We can't trust anything he says because he cannot say what he means. Here's what I'm saying to you, right? Suppose I come to you and I say, you, diva girl love, believe the Quran, follow the Quran. No one can change the Quran. Believe it, live by it, judge by it. And then I leave. 
And suppose someone comes along 14 centuries and say, oh, when David said, you know, believe the Quran and follow the Quran and, and judge by the Quran, he really meant some other book that you've never heard of before. Wouldn't you say, wow, David must be the stupidest person in the history of humanity if he couldn't just say what he meant? How did he not warn me? How did he not say, oh, by the way, when I say Quran, I mean some completely different book than what you think of as the Quran. If I'm talking to you, a Muslim, and I say Quran, that means something to you. And if I'm using the word in a radically different way, I should probably be pretty clear on that, right? If I'm commanding you to judge by a book, and I tell you, as Allah tells Christians in Surah, 4, Surah 5, verse 47, that we're rebels if we do not judge by the gospel. If, I then, if, if I'm talking about some other book that you've never heard of, then I'm the worst communicator in all of history. So you're telling us that your God is a moron. You're telling us that he's the worst communicator in history. You're saying that he's got some sort of cosmic Tourette syndrome. He's trying to tell us what to do, but he just can't get the words out right. Do you have any idea why this annoys me? You are massively insulting your own religion and your own God. I understand why I do it. Why do you do it? Right? So it's just, it's just, it's a, it's a sad situation. But I wanted to point out here, and Anthony, you, you can, you can, you can jump into all this too. But look, here we have the follow up. Here we have the follow up. Diva Girl Love said, Allah revealed the Injil to Jesus. Where is it? Couple of problems here. <laughs> Couple of problems here, Diva yeah. Girl Love. Allah, you say, Allah revealed the Injil. Do you know what the word Injil means? It means gospel. It's a transliteration. That means you're taking a, a, a word that's used in one language, trans, uh, transliterating it into another language that uses different letters. But the Arabic word injil is a transliteration that goes back to the Greek word euangelion, which is the Greek word for gospel. Notice, Greek word for gospel, not Hebrew word for gospel, not Aramaic word for gospel. So according to Allah, the book that Jesus had or his spoken message that was put into book form by his followers was in Greek. Do we have some, do we have a, a, a work in Greek? <laughs> do we have a work in Greek that Christians had and were still re reading in the seventh century? Yes, we do. It's called the fourfold gospel it consists of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You're saying that's not what he's trying to tell us. What's he sending us to? But look, here's, here's, what, here's what I pointed out and, 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 uh, and Tony can take it from here. Allah revealed the Injil to Jesus. Where is it? Listen to what you just said. Allah says we're reading it. He says in Surah, Surah 7, verse 157, that Christians read the gospel. He says we read it. So we have it. It's a book we have. I've got a lot of books in here. So the gospel must be in here somewhere because I'm reading. This is what I read, right? So we read it. Two, we're commanded to judge by it. He commands us to judge by the Injil. Three, Allah says we have no ground to stand upon unless we stand upon the Injil. You're saying, where is it? No, if you're saying that the Injil is not the book that we call the Injil, the gospel, right? If you're saying it's a different book, you have to tell us what the book is, right? You're telling it, you're coming to us saying, hey, Christians, you dummies, here's this book that you've been reading all along and you call it the gospel. Um, but Allah tells you to judge by the gospel, but you're so dumb, you don't realize that when he, re he commanded you repeatedly and said you were reading this book and you know what you're reading and to judge by this book and said that you had no ground to stand upon unless you stand upon this book. When he told you all that, you didn't realize that Allah is the worst communicator in all of history. And he was talking about some completely different book that you've never heard of, that you've never had access to, that you couldn't possibly be reading because you don't have it, that you can't possibly judge by because you don't have it, that you can't possibly stand upon because you don't have it. He was talking about that other book, you big dummies. You're telling us that that's what Allah was really saying. If you're telling us that Allah really meant some completely different book, you shouldn't be asking us about this imaginary book. You should. You have to show it to us, right? You're saying, no, that's the book Allah was talking about. It's over there. Or there it is. That's the book, not that gospel you were talking to. Again, this would be like me coming to you saying, hey, God commands you to judge by the Quran. The Quran that you've been reading, the Quran that you've had preserved for all this time, that's the book that God is commanding you to judge by. And oh, by the way, when I say that, I mean some different book that you've never had and you've never read and you've never been reading. That would be completely incoherent. You are massively, massively insulting your God. You're insulting your prophet. You're insulting your book. You're insulting your religion. And somehow, no matter how clearly we put it, you still don't get it. Do you see why we're concerned about the impact your religion has on your ability to think logically? Take it, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> that was a mouthful. 
<laughs> so, David, I would say that uh, the fact that Allah says that the Quran is mubin, mm-hmm. that it is clear. Absolutely. Is, it is far from being clear. You horribly, horribly unclear. Eloquently. Mm-hmm. And so the other issue here, as you rightly pointed out, is that, uh, and it claims to be pure Arabic. And Injil, as you rightly pointed out, is a borrowed term from the Greek word euangelion. Same with the word for the devil uh, in the Quran is called Iblis, which comes from the Greek diabolos. And so Iblis is basically a derivation from the Greek word diabolos. Um, now, here's, here's the problem. The problem is that we know exactly what as you rightly pointed out, we know what the Gospels look like. We have manuscripts, Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Vaticanus. We have uh, Papyrus 66, the uh, Chester, uh, BD, uh, the Bodmer Papyrus, and so forth. All of these have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. We know what the Christians were reading. And and so when when Muslims get so desperate that they they were touting the idea that the Gospel of Barnabas was this Gospel that the Quran talks about, it was a medieval forgery. It's a thousand years uh, written, after the time of Jesus, yeah. Even longer, yes. Yeah. And, and written in Italian and, and shown to be a, an absolute forgery. And so the, the grasping at, star, at straws here, David, is just absolutely incredible. And so um, I think that what Diva Girl has to do is look at the evidence. What did the gospel look like in the time of Muhammad? We know what it looked like. We have copies of it that predate Muhammad by... Uh, 200 years or more. So we know what those Gospels were. The onus is on her to show us what Gospel is this that she's coming up with. And if Allah can't even be clear on that, think about this, Diva Girl. If Allah cannot even be clear on the revelations that he gave to Jesus, then how would you trust him when it comes to your eternal uh, faith, your eternal soul? Mm -hmm. Are you willing to trust a God that cannot even tell you clearly what revelation he gave to Jesus in the, in, the, in the content of the gospel. I would be very, very concerned about your eternal destiny. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Tony, way back when we started, it's so almost two hours ago now, way back, <laughs> way back when we started, uh, we started talking a little bit about sort of Bayesian reasoning and starting with hypotheses and thinking about right. what we would expect given those hypotheses and then seeing whether right. the evidence confirms one hypothesis over another. Uh, Diva Girl Up. Assume for a moment that Allah is God and is clear, is mubin in his speech and has written a perfect, perfectly clear book called the Quran. If Allah is really trying to tell Christians, hey, there's this other book that you don't have and you need to judge by that. And that's the book. And this uh, this book that you have, you can't trust it. Um, you shouldn't rely on it. It's been corrupted. Um, what would we expect? Right. Would we expect Allah to repeatedly, over and over again, affirm the inspiration and the preservation and the authority of the book that we have in our possession and that we are commanded to judge by? Would we expect that? Not at all, right? On the other hand, suppose the Quran is actually the ramblings of a 7th century illiterate caravan trader who heard people talking about the Torah and the gospel, but couldn't read those things if his life had depended on it, and he hears stories about you know, Jesus, and he hears stories about Moses, and he hears stories about Abraham. That's all he can do because he can't read them, right? Does it make sense that that man would have completely misunderstood what's in those books, right? What's in those books. And so does it make sense to think that if he really believed he was a prophet, he might have thought that these books affirmed him as a prophet, and he might have thought that. And so he could affirm the inspiration and the preservation and the authority of these books because he's, he's ignorant. He doesn't know what's in those sources. Is it possible? In fact, isn't that exactly what you'd expect? Someone who can't actually read the books but thinks he's a prophet and thinks he's in line with the other prophets. Wouldn't you expect that man to go on and do exactly what we find in the Quran? Yes, the Torah and the gospel affirm me. The Torah and the gospel prove that I am a true prophet. No one can change the words of Allah. Christians, Jews, you have to listen to the books that you have. Wouldn't that make sense? Uh, so, of these two hypotheses, one, the Quran actually comes from God. Two, it comes from a uh, non-profit, 7th century illiterate caravan robber. Uh, one of them is massively confirmed. The other one is completely refuted. And somehow you're clinging to the idea that this actually comes from God. And you're saying some of the silliest things I've ever seen anyone see in my entire life. And that's saying something because... I deal with keyboard jihadis on a regular basis. 
So, Diva Girl Love, hope you come back. <laughs> and I know you will, because you can't stay away. You're being drawn. <laughs> You're being drawn to us. <laughs> and that's awesome to see. All right, Tony. Well, it's 10 o'clock. We've been going two hours straight. Um, Tony, if you refuse to leave that horrible, horrible, horrible country and refuse <laughs> to move down here where we can go live all the time, we at least need to get together for like three or four days sometime where we just record a massive number of videos uh, so we yes. can put those out there. Absolutely. I would be glad to come up to you, but your country would lock me up the second I got there. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Uh, well, well, when I come down, David, I, I hope to spend some time with you and uh, maybe we can do that then. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and wh whatever else happens, ladies and gentlemen, again, uh, especially for those who uh, weren't here uh, at the beginning. Um, Tony and I, Lord willing, are going to be with Jay Smith out in California in September. So if you are uh, in any sort of traveling distance um, from California, that's going to be one of the best conferences of the year so definitely get out there and you can hang out with me and tony and jay smith and i'm going to do my best this year to get that thing live streamed um all right thank you for uh thank you to tony for joining us thanks for everyone who submitted questions uh as usual guys i don't get to most questions um but that's why we keep doing live streams because you know we keep going through them and um we keep giving muslims the attention they want and hopefully 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 some of this breaks through their hard hearts breaks through that darkness that islam and muhammad have cast around their minds and hopefully they can see the light as we have god bless everyone god bless